Uh, welcome to the very first lecture for Origins. And so the way these are going to work is uh, I will provide you a lecture based on your reading, based very closely on the reading, uh, as an additional resource for you as you prepare for the reading quizzes that we'll do in class. So this is the material that we'll cover the very first day of class. My hope is that you will use these videos as a way to enhance your reading and prepare for the discussion that we're going to have on this material in class. I will not lecture through this material in this way when we meet together and instead I will work on primarily facilitating discussion on these materials and taking it uh, to the next level. So the first couple of uh, chapters of the, the textbook that we're going to be using uh, by Leonard Brand and Art Chadwick uh, covers these ideas. What is science? Uh, and how do we use it? How do we do science well? The first thing we need to talk about is uh, scientific method. A couple of keys uh, I want to point out, and they're made uh, in the text, is that science is an ongoing process. It's not a um, just a set of procedures that uh, gets you through this process, and then all of a sudden you've achieved uh, the, the goal of science. Instead, science uh, is an isn't constantly ongoing uh, process and you can see that illustrated here uh, in this wheel modeling uh, the scientific method and I actually like this uh, diagram a lot the citation for it is 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 down below and so there's a big difference between science and just making observations uh, in order for something to be science um, and what science is it's it is it's a a quest for truth brand and, and Chadwick talked about that a lot. It's a quest for truth using repeated bouts of experimentation. And so, but what it tends to start at is observations. And so they give the illustration of watching a chipmunk peel a raisin versus then going and, and, and actually doing science from it. You, you can't just stop at your observations and list that out and say that's science. It's not, that's not science. Uh, instead, you have to move on from those observations. After making the observations, say, about these chipmunks peeling these raisins, you ask yourself a, a, a thought-provoking uh, question of, uh, do um, chipmunks process their food in this way to maximize the energy input for the amount of energy invested? Or, or something along those lines. So your observations lead directly into specific questions to ask after you've noted trends through your observation. From there, you, you answer these questions. Um, you, you come up with a potential answer to this question, and these are your hypotheses. Your hypotheses should never be phrased as questions. Uh, oftentimes I see that, and, and that, that's an incorrect way of doing science. Uh, in fact, these hypotheses are answers to the questions you asked about your observations. They are not questions. And then once you've formulated that answer to the question, from there, you, you figure out a way to, to test this, uh, to test if your answer is right. So if you you hypothesize that chipmunks are peeling their fruit in that way in order to maximize the, uh, the energy input uh, while minimizing the energy investment, uh, well then, you know, you, you develop a, an experiment that maybe you give them raisins that are already peeled versus uh, raisins that aren't and, and see if there's actually... Um, some value or, or get them to eat raisins that, that aren't peeled in some way and see if they're, they are in fact maximizing their energy output. Or you could just look at it chemically and say, you know, what, what does the skin of that raisin actually provide uh, compared to the meat of that raisin? And then from there, you know, you, 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 you gather these data from your uh, tests, from your experiments, and you interpret them uh, to come up with theories that explain uh, your trends, or you can refine your hypothesis, and maybe your data don't match up with it as when you go to interpret those. So you uh, retool your um, uh, your predictions a little bit. Uh, you retool your your studies a little bit, and and you continue to do this. Um, and then now all of the findings of whatever that is become observations for future work. And this is again how science is just this is ongoing uh, process. And so we see in, as, as we carry out science, the steps, they're, they're, they're basically two broad categories. Both these images come from our textbook. There's a collection of data here, uh, collecting of these fragments of glass, and then there's the interpretation of the data. And that's a very important key aspect of science is the interpretation of those data. And so they go through uh, 
Brand and Chad would go through this explanation on how everybody uh, can be given the same set of data and they come up with uh, basically A, B, and C, three different hypotheses about what this vase looked like. And in this case, D is the actual vase. And so you see not, none of these three are uh, actually correct, um, but they're all kind of providing some kind of um, a, a clue as to what these uh, are. And in this case, it, it, it just so happened that that your your category of hypothesis was right, that it was some kind of a, a vase. Uh, you know, it could have very well been something completely different. Um, but even um, in, in this case where it was some kind of a vase, you can see widely uh, varying ideas of what it actually looked like. And all three of these would represent hypotheses that, that, that are actually uh, wrong. And so this is an important point to, to point out that in the process of doing science, you have to interpret those data. And the, your interpretations are dependent upon how much data you actually have and previous understandings and ideas and notions about how things work. Uh, and so the, the actual process of science uh, cannot be separated from those interpretations. It's not just the empirical data, it's also the interpretation of those data. And so we have this question, you know, thinking back to this, you know, A, B, and C, they're, they're all good hypotheses or good theories on, on what these shards of glass were from because they actually are representing, you know, somewhat uh, the reality of it being a vase. And so the question is, well, what makes a good theory? Because obviously there are going to be theories that aren't good theories. There are going to be theories that are good theories. But how do we how do we characterize or, or qualify a good theory. First thing is, is it has to make sense of previously isolated data. And so in this case, different pieces of, of glass, the different fragments, a good theory uh, is going to make sense of those isolated pieces of data and, and combine them into some cohesive whole. Uh, we see this a lot, the, and, the, and Brand and Chadwick talk about this a lot in uh, in their book about the theory of, of, of evolution and that it actually is a good theory and that it does a good job of making sense of previously isolated data, like um, homologous features, the fact that we share um, features with a number of different organisms, uh, similar uh, genetic makeup, um, vestigial traits, that there are these... these uh, isolated pieces of data that, that, are, that are combined uh, in this theory. Uh, another aspect of a good um, theory is that it uh, suggests new experiments and therefore it, it drives the scientific process. So theory doesn't just explain these pieces of isolated data, but it additionally suggests out of that theory new experiences, experiments that you might do. So again, with this uh, theory of evolution, um, you know, it, it, it from that suggests new experiments on testing that idea of universal common descent among various groups. Um, and so, uh, again, characteristic of a good theory, it must be testable. That is, uh, you, you must actually be able to formulate ways of testing this, this theory. Uh, the fourth, uh, whatever these experiments to test your theory, uh, should be repeatable, and they should be repeatable by different individuals under different uh, characteristics and under different conditions. And uh, so that's um, that's a very important aspect of a good theory uh, that, you know, you're connecting all these various pieces of data, and you even tested it, but other people should be able to test it under different conditions and basically come to the same idea with regard uh, to that theory. Uh, and also a good theory, it, it, it needs to be able to predict the outcome of future experiments. So again, the, the theory of evolution, as you do future experiments, say, on the use of, you know, a particular chemical product in, the, in a cell, um, and in a cell that you don't exactly know what it does, um, but because of this idea that these the cells in this organism are in some way related to the cells of another organism because of this idea of universal common descent, that you should be able to predict the outcome that whatever this product is, is going to be used by uh, organism B in a similar way that it was used uh, uh, by organism A 
um, because ultimately they derive uh, from the same um, the same ancestor. Now, this is in no way to say that uh, the, the theory of evolution is necessarily true, but rather that it meets the characteristics of a good theory uh, and that it makes sense of previous data, suggests new experiments, it's testable, uh, the tests are repeatable, and it does predict the outcome of future experiments. Um, notice what's missing. So this question of what makes a good theory, nowhere in here did I mention that it's right. And, and that's an important character, uh, an important piece of information to point out is, is a good theory can be a good theory even if it's wrong. Um, and that's something that's maybe a hard pill to swallow, but that's something we'll talk about more uh, when we actually sit down and, and have class together. How can a theory be good even if it's wrong? And, and if it's wrong, ultimately it, it needs to be replaced. Um, and that's going to lead to us necessarily replacing good theories, which is an interesting thing to think about. And so a good illustration from this, from, from our text, from our text from Brand and Chadwick, is uh, the two different ideas about bats. So Spallanzani had this idea that, that bats in some way relied on their hearing um, in, in order to navigate around a dark room. Whereas Cuvier had this idea that they relied on their feelings, on, on touch stimuli to navigate their way around a, a dark room. And uh, Spanzani's, they were both good theories. They both made sense of previous isolated data that bats navigate well in, in rooms uh, with virtually no light, uh, suggested new experiments on, on how we could, um, you know, alter the conditions and, and do this. It was, it was testable. Um, the experiments to test the theory were repeatable and they're different people in different conditions, predicted the outcome of future experiments, but only Spallanzani's was right. Cuvier's was actually wrong about what bats relied on, but it took over a hundred years to figure that out until we could actually find evidence of bats using echolocation uh, to, to get around a room. And so uh, leading directly from, you know, what makes a, a good theory uh, to what makes a good scientist. And so there are a couple of different examples provided in our text of a, a characteristic of a good scientist. And, and basically, the most important characteristic of a good scientist, other than uh, knowing you know, the scientific method and being efficient in your operating through that, is being, is being a highly observant person. So the, the text talks a great deal about that it doesn't matter where your observations come from. Observations can come from anywhere. And, and what I said before, that, that science is an endeavor for truth based on repeated in, experimentation and interpretation. Um, it doesn't matter where those observations come from because that's not the end of our science. The end of our science, well, there is no end of science because it's a continual process. But all of those observations give, for, give rise to questions. And those questions give rise to potential answers. And those potential answers give rise to predictions. And then those predictions are tested. And so what makes a good scientist is somebody who's uh, ready to make observations wherever they are, an incredibly observant uh, person and somebody that's willing to take the observations from anywhere. So the two illustrations, one is in Archimedes. Uh, when he's given a task by the king to figure out if this crown is actually pure gold. And he notices that the, the crown displaces water. So he has this idea to, to determine whether it's it's truly gold based on the density and, and goes running out of the bath saying, Eureka, I found it. Uh, and then the other illustration for Paramiscus, white-footed mice specifically, but this genus Paramiscus, uh, and somebody... Uh, just happened to observe them on the beach and, and an incredibly observant person uh, made a chance observation and then from there we're able to predict that maybe this mouse species has done something that no population has done before and that's uh, adapted to uh, beach living. So what makes a good scientist other than operating efficiently through the scientific method is, is somebody that's incredibly observant and willing to take observations from anywhere. So then now we transition over to chapter two and we start talking about uh, how do we do science? How do we use science? Um, and so it's important to start there talking about the limitations of science. And you actually see this discussion start at the very end of chapter one. Uh, what are the limitations of science? And so I want to first uh, re reiterate that there are both true and false theories. Remember, a good theory uh, 
isn't necessarily right or isn't necessarily true, and it could still be a good theory. Uh, it just needs to be replaced and refined as, as new evidence comes in. But you notice um, science uh, represented by this uh, ellipse here is only um, making up a portion of our total theories, that there are theories that come from uh, areas outside of science. There are theories that come from theology and metaphysics and philosophy that are outside of the realm of science, keeping in mind that science is a search for truth based on experimentation and interpretation of data. And so science requires empirical data, things that you can see or smell or hear or taste or touch. And um, so there, science, science is, is limited. So that's one of the limitations of science is there are some areas of truth that you cannot address with science. Another limitation of science is what we've mentioned several times already, that there are good theories that just are false. And so they meet the qualification of being a good theory, but we just don't have enough data to know that they're false yet. So what do you need to actually do science? Uh, it's an important question that's addressed in, in chapter two. Uh, so the first major category, the first major feature that you need to do science is, is logic. And so um, what, what you find, and, and one, one thing that becomes, um, or why logic is required so much in science, is it's very difficult to prove something right. It's extremely difficult to prove something right. So let's say, again, your theory, let's go back to our chipmunks, that the chipmunks are peeling their raisins in order to maximize their energy input for the amount invested in both uh, preparing their food, but then also in digesting their food. So it's very difficult to prove that that hypothesis is right. However, it becomes very helpful to actually prove that something is wrong. And this can actually help you use a great deal of logic where you provide alternative hypotheses to your hypothesis and show evidence against those. In, in essence, building a case for your hypothesis. Another area of logic is called deductive reasoning. Science is, is basically this deductive inductive cycle uh, as you move. So the idea of deductive reasoning um, is, it, is it starts with a generalization and applies that to new data. And so the, the example given in, in the text is that um, basically with the, with the ground squirrels that Dr. Brand noticed uh, these ground squirrels in trees but had assumed based on deductive reasoning that they were not ground squirrels but instead were a species of chipmunk because ground squirrels don't Ne don't go in trees, no nest in trees. And so this is deductive reasoning, assuming um, something about your new data set based on uh, previous generalization. Again, logic of inductive reasoning. Now this uh, starts with basically making observations about a, a, a piece of data and then building those generalizations from it, predicting the unknown. And again, science is just this constant cycle of deductive and inductive reasoning where we take generalizations or these broad observations and make the predictions about this and then we go and test them or we observe a population and then we you know, make predictions about all populations and generalization about these species. And that's why we need this just constant refinement and a, and a great deal of, of logic as we go through you know, what's reasonable to assume. Is it reasonable to assume that every new piece of data that we find are going to match these generalizations? Is it reasonable to assume that uh, the all species are going to behave like this population? Again, science requiring a great deal of, of logic. And then so we have this question, well, well how do we deal uh, with these limitations of logic? There's several ways we can deal with these. Um, two, the two main ways is we use multiple hypotheses. Again, because it's very difficult to prove something right, and because our generalizations oftentimes are wrong, and because one population that we're observing may not represent the whole at all, we have to use multiple hypotheses and test those and keep them side by side. And then we need to ask questions of why. And so this is a really big difference between asking what questions and asking why questions. So what questions are things like, you know, um, when do um, when do chipmunks uh, enter um, enter into estrus and become receptive uh, to to mating? Um, when in the year do um, you know 
or where do these chipmunks forward? These are what questions. But when you ask why questions, questions like what is the fitness advantage associated with these ground squirrels nesting and, and foraging in trees? Now you're getting away from these what questions and in many ways you're getting away from the limitations of this deductive inductive cycle because we're asking questions of why dealing a great deal with this idea of, of fitness. Um, what is the fitness advantage of this behavior? Another big aspect of what we need to do science is experimental design. Uh, we have this problem of sample size, and they uh, illustrate it uh, throughout the throughout the book uh, in a number of different ways. And um, so they, they talk about bacteria and, and trying to represent, you know, what is the human mouth like with just, you know, sample size. And even if you were able to sample every single human being, which is an enormous uh, sample size, you know, the fact is that you can't count every individual bacterium. And so we have this constant problem of sample size that we're having to deal with in our experimental design. Can we have a large enough sample to represent the whole in such a way that it's still feasible and reasonable and uh, manageable? Uh, the need for a control, and so a control is not just controlling all of, it, it's, it's actually not this at all, it's not just it's not that it's not just controlling all of the variables. That's not a control at all, although that's important in an experiment. A control is a baseline. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a way of, it's a group that you could compare your experimental data to. So going back to Spallanzani's work with, with bats um, and blocking their ear canals and knowing that now they hit a lot more wires than they did without their ear canals blocked, and it's like, okay, well, our control group is bats without their ears blocked. But then he had some concern, okay, but are they hitting more wires because they can't hear? Or are they hitting more wires because they've got these bulky objects uh, hanging out of their ears? So then his control group became bats that had hollowed out pieces that they, that they wore in their ears. So they were still carrying the extra weight and that discomfort, but could still hear. And now that became his control group to compare the bats that had the blocked ear canals. And then also in experimental design, we, we need quantitative data. And so this is another big way in which we can deal with the limitations of logic uh, is to actually have quantitative data. And quantitative data are just like what they sound, they're, they're, they're numbers. Um, and so a number of examples given in this book uh, along this idea, I give a couple from geology where people are looking at rock samples and are overwhelmed by these big, you know, really um, vibrant colored pebbles. Um, and so assume that most of the rock is made up of those. But then when you go through the painstaking effort of actually counting them, you realize far more volume uh, of that rock sample is actually devoted to something that's a lot smaller pebble size and, and planar. Uh, and another example that they gave was on salamanders. Um, you know, the idea was that salamanders, when they're in shallow water, they spend most of their time kind of swimming through it and very little time walking along the surface. And that's because when you look at salamanders, it's very, um, it's, it's, it's very charismatic when they're swimming up to the surface to take a breath. And that's something that's very noticeable. And our brains tend to emphasize that because it's exciting and it's, it's a lot of action. It's, it's actually fairly boring and dull and hard to notice them walking along the surface of the water. But when you sit and you watch for hours on end, you find that they spend the bulk of their time walking along the surface. So um, another limitation of science, we talked about limitations of science already in that you can't deal with some areas of truth and that there are some theories that are just false. But another limitation of science is, is something that we talked about in chapter one at the beginning of this presentation, is that it's both data collection and data interpretation. And when you're talking about data interpretation, uh, there's going to be bias based, the, the observer, the, the, the scientist is going to input bias. And so we need to talk a little bit about how this bias manifests itself. Sometimes, but very rarely, it's outright deception. Um, they talked about a paleontologist that was buying fossils and saying that he found them uh, throughout the Himalayan range, even in places where he had never actually been, uh, in order to build a name for himself. This is rare, but it does happen, and it is an unfortunate introduction of bias to science. What's, what's, what's far more common is glossing over data that don't line up. 
So let's say you complete a, an experiment five times. Four of them um, give you basically the same results, but one of them doesn't. And so the idea of thinking, oh, well, maybe I did something wrong in that setup, but it worked this four times and not this one, and assuming the four that it worked or that, that line up are correct, and the one that didn't have the same data is, is actually wrong. That's oftentimes a more common area of bias. Um, also, one that's fairly common is to overestimate estimate the influence of some factors. And we even saw this uh, with the idea of, of salamanders and do they walk along the bottom or do they swim, overestimating the influence of swimming, that behavior. So another way uh, bias enters is uh, faulty deducti deductive reasoning where we have some entrenched theories that are false, uh, but we make predictions based on those generalizations if those theories are in fact wrong. Um, and so you can see this in uh, two philosophers of science, uh, Bacon and Popper, where Bacon was like, Be because of this, um, because of this bias, we need to make sure every time somebody does science that they they leave all of their preconceived notion, everything that they understood before, and just observe something for the first time. And Popper says, no, that's that's absurd, because then you're going to make predictions that are basically impossible if you don't bring any of your understanding of how the natural world works. Uh, so Popper and Bacon both understood the problem of bias in science, um, but Popper understood that there's kind of a, a different way that we eliminate the bias. Bacon tried to eliminate bias. So how do we eliminate bias? Bacon would say you basically forget everything you know whenever you do science. Uh, Popper would say, well, that's absurd because you're going to make predictions that don't make any sense. Uh, Popper would say, how do we eliminate bias? We, we eliminate bias by having um, science be a collaborative effort, by having everybody being critical of other people's work, not in any, you know, pejorative or in incredibly detrimental way, but in, in basically checking and carrying out the work themselves. So science as, as a collaboration becomes the way that we eliminate bias, according to Popper. This is the way that science works. It, you know, it, Bacon was had some good thoughts, but the idea of leaving everything we know behind, well, one, it ruins the idea of deductive reasoning. It, it just removes it from science. Uh, but two, it, it really is impossible. You can't forget what you know whenever you're doing science. But s science is a collaborative effort as, as, as different scientists check each other's work and are critical of other scientists' interpretations, it, it becomes a mechanism by which we eliminate bias. And so um, then we have a question, okay, well, how do, we, how do we get away from then that all we have are tentative theories? You know, one scientist interprets the data this way tentatively, you know, collects all these discrete, disconnected pieces of data, makes this great theory, but then, you know, before it even gets to publication, gets to the audience, somebody's already found data that refute that that theory. How do we how do we avoid extremely tentative theories like that in an effort to still eliminate bias? Uh, and the best way to do that is is uh, similar to what we um, what we were talking about before, uh, in in terms of. Uh, trying to um, eliminate uh, when we when we we're using multiple uh, working hypotheses and oh gosh let's go let me just go back rather than trying to, to figure out um, how we same way we deal with our limitations of logic using multiple hypotheses and always asking this question of why is something happening versus what's happening. It's also a way of eliminating these tentative theories. And so when you interpret your data, you actually offer multiple explanations for these, um, these pieces of data and multiple explanations for how these address your particular research question. And then as time goes on, some of these uh, explanations disappear, but all of them basically become a potential explanation rather than narrowing it down to a single one and, and moving from there. And so an important thing to point out as we talk about all of this of tentative theories um, is this, this idea of perspective. And so they, they talk about this that um, basically there's, there's, there's two broad areas of science, both of which are important and both of which are essential. Um, and that's those that... Um, 
our, our perspective is is spot on because it's it's a here and the now and parasitology is one of these so if we ask ourselves the research question of um you know how do raccoon roundworms a, an intestinal parasite in raccoons transmit or transfer from one individual host to another so this our, our perspective is spot on is that's that's a here and now problem but in paleontology we don't we don't have that opportunity our perspective is too small you know we're dealing with thousands uh, according to a, a young earth idea of, of origins uh, or millions according to a you know, a different view of origins of years, and we're only looking at a small snapshot uh, of, of that time. And on top of that, we're only dealing with like a small area of the globe. And so our, our perspective is, is too narrow. And so here's a, um, a fossil procyonid from um, the, uh, I, I think from the Miocene. And um, so when we're trying to make procyonids on these these fossil procyonids, um, we're basing it on living procyonids, and and our perspective is oftentimes uh, too small. And that's not to say that it's not important to go through this process of trying to make predictions. It's just important to understand that our perspective is is too small and too narrow. And last thing I, I wanted to talk about, and this is something that came up at the very end of of chapter two, um, is that we have to understand that interpretations aren't data. So the interpretation of data is not the same thing as those data. Remember that there are two parts of science. There's data collection and data interpretation. And so Jerry Coyne is a very famous biologist, and he wrote a book called Why Evolution is True. And in here he argues uh, you, you know, for universal karma descent um, using you know, uh, homologous features, vestigial traits, um, shared molecular signatures, uh, shared biochemical features. Um, and, and while those data are all true, his interpretations are not the same thing as empirical data. And you may choose to agree or disagree with his interpretations, but it's important to point out that the interpretations of data are not the data themselves. They're in separate categories and need to be treated differently. So again, these lectures are just a way for you to prepare for our uh, discussion. They're also a way to enhance your reading and in preparation for our reading quiz. So as you prepare for our reading quiz on our first day of class, um, I hope this video uh, helps you uh, helps you as you do that.